Hello. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, I uh, started CVSA with a handful of physicians and families in 1993. Um, and B. Lee was one of the main movers and shakers. So you've just had an opportunity to really hear from the ground roots um, up to the present. Um, over well, probably 30 years, he, we can count with his involvement with with CVS, and 27 with CVSA. So um, I've had the opportunity, which has been um, extremely satisfying, work with uh, the physicians and the families and the boards and over the years. And um, I think that the landmarks definitely uh, include these guidelines that have been created. And I, I was had trouble getting into the Zoom, and plus I'm in the mount, wrong time zone for all of you, and I goofed up a little bit there. But um, I'm not sure how much B talked about the guidelines, but in 2004, three or four is when we started a five-year process of developing the guidelines for pediatrics. 2008 is when they were published and that makes them old and so um, you probably know by now that we are now doing an update with about um, nine ten um, cross-specialty people the and we've done the same for the adult guidelines which came out in June of, of 91 I mean excuse me 19 2019 so the process is extremely rigorous it's heavily scrutinized it is peer-reviewed, it is um, exhaustive discussion. It's voting when it comes time to decide on what to put in, what not to put in, the, the voting happens. So the, this is just really stellar work that's been done for these three different, with one going on in the first two um, that were done. So um, the CVSA has had the, um, pleasure, I think I would call it pleasure, of being the financial, the, the, the only financial support for the guidelines so far. Um, and we're proud of that. And the, the fundraising is not the fun, pleasant part, but um, the, the process and the product is so very worthwhile and so very important because CVSA has, has CVS knowledge has gone um, global and we've, there's been so much benefit that's come from the hard work. So um, uh, uh, these documents are available on the website and we hope that this next update of the pediatric guidelines will not take five years. We're hoping for more like between three and four. Um, and it's being led by Dr. Kovacic who has, has um, Dr. Lee mentioned has taken over the clinic at the MCW Children's Hospital. So if there's anything else specific that um, would help to hear and know about um, that I haven't just quickly mentioned, I'd be happy to say more or go right on into the Q&A. Um, Debbie, I don't know if you have any advice about that or not. No, I think you covered it. And I think we might actually have B back. Yes. All right, perfect. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, you're welcome. It's happy to be, happy to be watching. Okay, so we'll move on to our uh, question and answer with Dr. Lee. Um, first question, can an individual with CVS also have symptoms of POTS without being diagnosed with POTS? Uh, this is uh, still uh, a ongoing area of uh, research. Uh, we have found not only in cyclic vomiting syndrome, but other what we call functional disorders like um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, that there is a high prevalence of POTS in, um, in teenagers especially. It's it's more of a teenage illness than uh, childhood or adult, uh, and it does occur in, in young adults. Uh, fortunately, it does tend to get better. What the connection is is unclear, but we know that um, 
that one of the big things is that the autonomic uh, system that regulates automatically your functions like blood pressure, pulse, the response to stress, uh, often goes awry in response to a viral infection. And then uh, some of the things that can result are POTS and then other functional uh, complaints. So that if you look at uh, adults or children with CVS, uh, you find these other complaints that I talked about. But if you look at an irritable bowel cohort, they also have these same other complaints that they don't sleep well, they have anxiety, uh, they um, <clears throat> have uh, uh, dizziness. If you uh, even look at um, uh, teenage girls with nausea, which we publish, they also have many, many other kind of disabling symptoms other than nausea, including dizziness, uh, headache, and, and so forth. So are all of these related to the autonomic nervous system? It's not quite as simple as that because with CVS, there is a little bit of literature from Chalimsky that suggests if you treat the CVS aggressive, uh, treat the POTS aggressively, the CVS gets better. But uh, I have seen, I've not always seen that work. In other words, I've even had children where I put them in the hospital over the weekend when they're not in school and just tank them up with IV fluids to increase their volume so that they don't get dizziness and it hasn't made the CVS better. Um, and typically now with CVS, we're, we're actually preventatively treating POTS with lots of fluid, extra salt uh, in the realm of uh, two to even four grams per day, uh, and then lots of fluids um, and uh, using fludrocortisone. And um, I unfortunately, it doesn't always make the CVS better. So there is a clear, there is a connection between them, but it's a broader connection between functional disorders and uh, and a normal uh, autonomic system often triggered by a viral. So that, uh, in other words, a person is fine and then all of a sudden they had a stomach flu and then after that they get dizziness when they stand up. And I will tell you, I have seen uh, kids where the, the typical screening is that they lie down for five minutes, they have a Dynamap on and you measure blood pressure and pulse uh, while they're lying down and then three, five and 10 minutes afterwards and their pulse uh, their blood pressure usually stays the same, but their pulse skyrockets by about 40. So it's like they're running in place, but all they did was stand up. And it's the uh, heart trying to make up for the fact that it's saying there's not enough blood by pumping faster. And uh, so that is a kind of response. So I've seen actually about three teenagers in clinic when we did this test that, that uh, uh, fainted <laughs> with a test. And, uh, and so I, I asked, uh, for example, well, how do you have to stand in line at, at the, you know, in, in the cafeteria, don't you? She said, I do, but I, I fidget. And, she, and you could tell with her feet that she has ways using her muscle contractions to actually push blood up to her head. So it, I don't have a definitive answer, but there is a connection. Um, Debbie, okay. next one. Very interesting, thank you. CVS uh, daughter was just diagnosed with celiac disease. What is the chance her illness has been celiac all along and not CVS, or is the celiac disease triggering CVS? What's the prevalence of having both? I, I think it's the luck of having two things. This is kind of a unique thing, uh, but it turns out that, uh, you know, I've just seen so many that I do have kids with celiac disease and CVS. And when you look at the frequency on either side, it doesn't seem to be increased. Uh, so unfortunately, it looks like a, just a bad luck of the draw. Obviously, if um, could wheat or gluten act as a trigger, I think it's possible. Uh, we have seen that in the literature more with wheat allergy, which is a different mechanism than a celiac disease. Uh, so I think it's just um, just by chance. Thank you. How uh, how likely is it that a calendar kid outgrows CVS, and what is the average age? This was I picked this question out because I don't have the answer to this, and I'm the one that has kind of coined this um, because I was struck by 
kids, um, a typical one would have it every 63 days. And I ask the parents before they come in to do a calendar for the last year and to calculate the interval from the first day to the first day. And uh, they, it would come in 61, 63, 62, 64, 62. It was uncanny. And what I learned from breaking this uh, uh, group out as a different subgroup is that this is the most difficult group to manage. In fact, in most of the other kids, I'm maybe 80% successful in, in controlling it. But this one it was probably flipped the other way around. Uh, I've had a couple successes, uh, but then I tried to use it in other patients and it didn't work. It's almost like it was hard, hardwired in. So I unfortunately don't know what will happen to them um, as a subgroup, but there is, uh, we are hopefully starting a registry that will cover migraine and CVS. And um, it is just now in the planning phase. We're actually having our first meeting um, coming up next week and hope to, to know this in about a decade, but unfortunately not of much help. I will tell you uh, for uh, the individual that posed this, that we are having some success with using a Prepitin. I, I used that before uh, and then uh, using it uh, right before the anticipated episode. So that may be one suggestion for your physician. Uh, next question, Debbie. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, is there any evidence CVS can be caused by infections such as mold or candida or by heavy metals? And if so, by clearing these from the body, will CVS subside? Uh, again, a very typical question, but um, I certainly, we do know for example, that infections are a trigger of this. Um, uh, and um, uh, so that, in other words, uh, stomach flu, um, colds can be a trigger. It, it's like a stress on the body. And we know from animal research that uh, infections increase that CRF, that one hormone, that may also act as a secondary trigger. So yes, I think that is very uh, possible. With toxins, um, it's less clear. I have had several kids where their house uh, became contaminated by mold and they had to leave that environment and it uh, seemed to get better. Uh, I've had one where their uh, house was contaminated uh, chemically also, um, but as a general rule, I can't say that this is widespread, um, but I think of these as triggers. So what I mean by that is that um, uh, the child or adult actually has CBS or is susceptible to CBS because of the migraine family history, and then a number of things can trigger it off. So it can be periods, it can be stress, it can be infection, it can be overuse of uh, marijuana. And so I think that is probably the, the best way to look at that. Okay. Next. Let's, um, since you brought up marijuana, let's um, ask the question, how, how can you differentiate between cyclic vomiting syndrome and cannabinoid induced hyperemesis? Uh, as you saw from my talk, and it was just a chance to reiterate that we think that CHS the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome is CVS with a uh, cannabis trigger. So it's not really a separate disease, it's just that it has a different trigger. And unfortunately, I, I've heard from adult sufferers that um, the, the sad part now is in the emergency room, very often someone comes in with a a typical bout of CVS and a history of CVS. And of course, they will ask, have you smoked marijuana? And uh, people use it uh, for chemotherapy uh, and so forth. And they say, yes. Uh, so that obviously a lot of people have tried it. And then they say, oh, you have CHS. But they don't take an accurate history because generally it's very high dose and very persistent. And so one of the points I'd like to make is that I think it has a biphasic effect. I proposed this uh, some time ago because I have had teenagers who have, uh, for example, panic anxiety, and they will take one uh, little uh, intake and it will 
and it does act as an anxiolytic. It will smooth their anxiety and they can go to school. That's not a high dose recreational use. So I think in low doses, it probably has a therapeutic effect, but it has a biphasic effect in very high doses over a long period of time. It actually changes the receptor. And that is Dr. Ben Contessin's uh, now hypothesis that she is trying to prove uh, and submitting a grant on. So that at low dose, it, it may have some benefit uh, and we don't know about cannab cannabidiol yet. And uh, unfortunately, the cannabidiol you can buy is all over the place. Some of it has very little, some of it does have. But at high dose, it's a different, uh, and, and over a long period of time, it probably does change your physiology. And so that's why you're getting conflicting views about cannabis. And unfortunately, a lot of people are getting pegged in emergency rooms as abusers of this and when they, in fact, have CVS. Thank you for addressing that. That's a very common question I get in the office um, from many adult uh, CVS patients. Um, if my daughter has CVS, can I send her back to school this fall during the pandemic? Uh, this is a difficult one. And uh, people have asked that about activity in general, vacations, and now uh, with a pandemic. And I think uh, obviously uh, an infection could be a trigger, but I think the uh, likelihood is, is obviously a, a serious illness is lower in kids, even though there is this multi-system uh, uh, syndrome that seems quite rare. Uh, but I, I think that the benefits of school uh, really outweigh the, the chance that it will get triggered. Uh, by it. And, and so uh, I think as I would in, in all cases, try to normalize as much as you can because the benefits of uh, the social interaction and the, the higher degree of learning is uh, the overall benefit. So that, that's kind of my general uh, approach. Um, so, but obviously every family has to approach it uh, given their particular circumstance. Absolutely. Can you talk about post-viral dysautonomia and its tie with CVS? Can it look like CVS in coalescence? Um, and this I alluded to a little bit uh, when we uh, talked about the POTS, uh, that uh, the concept I think that uh, many uh, physicians who deal with the autonomic nervous system, and that's a whole nother kind of specialty or subspecialty or sub subspecialty in itself, uh, is that, um, that viral infections can upset the balance. And then, uh, and then you recover from the infection, but you are left with, uh, you can be left with cramping IBS, which often starts after a intestinal infection, or your, your um, your autonomic system control regulation is thrown off kilter following an infection. So you're done with the infection. And then, of course, uh, you are left with this, uh, this aftermath that's very difficult. One of the ones that is fairly well described is called post-viral gastroparesis. Uh, and I've definitely seen multiple cases during my career where afterwards the stomach gets paralyzed. Generally, it will go away. But um, we have uh, definitely seen cases where uh, it's upset. So we know that somehow uh, the uh, viruses can kind of intercalate itself and mess up the autonomic uh, system. Uh, no question about that. And uh, again, not all doctors really recognize it. Most autonomic subspecialists uh, recognize it, but not all uh, regular physicians understand that. Okay, um, let's see. I usually get attacks when I have severe pain and wanted to know how women with CVS have dealt with it during pregnancy. Does morning sickness trigger episodes and during labor, would the pain trigger another episode? Um, you know, some of this I, I can't answer. It was a, obviously a very interesting question and I don't think anybody has written on this and uh, I was curious about it and I s had just on the uh, listserv um, sent out a few questions about whether uh, it got better during 
pregnancy, got worse during pregnancy, and I really got a mix of answers. So that wasn't really a study, but just my curiosity, because um, some actually don't get actually get better during pregnancy, and obviously it has to be hormonal, but you have heard of, uh, of uh, you know, hyperemesis gravidarum. And, uh, and uh, I found a few kids with CBS whose mothers had hyperemesis gravidarum, and I thought, oh, this, I wonder if this is a clue, but it seemed to be pretty uncommon. Um, so there are some who get very, very uh, bad, but that's a different entity where you literally every day for nine months uh, can eat. And some have to go on parenteral uh, IV nutrition for their entire pregnancy. And uh, one of the best descriptions I saw was a woman who described this in the New Yorker and uh, couldn't eat. You know, I think she might have been a physician. And the minute that she delivered, she yelled out, I want a cheeseburger. It was done. It was uh, completely done. So that was uh, interesting. Um, so clearly there's a hormonal aspect of it. The pain one I commented earlier is um, uh, interesting because I have seen this in teenage girls and young adult women who have severe pain where it crescendos and, and then leads to a full episode of vomiting. If they can control the pain, it seems to prevent the vomiting. And uh, several of them told me, uh, so this is the thing, that other narcotics didn't work, but only hydromorphone worked. And I did witness it myself several times in the, in the hospital, uh, where I gave it by injection, and it stopped it cold within 10 minutes. It was the most amazing. In this day and age, I think uh, this is a hard sell because uh, if you come in saying, I would like to get a hydromorphone injection, uh, obviously they're going to look at you as a narcotic abuser. So I, I don't have an easy solution uh, for this, um, but I have seen it work in a, a few. And for some reason, why women, I, I can't really explain. Thank you for addressing that one. Um, can you be more than one subtype? Very good question. Uh, also, yes. So most of uh, the migraines is the biggest one, but uh, a person with a Sato with a high blood pressure during episodes uh, can also have a uh, migraine, migraine family history. And yes, you can be more than one subtype. So eventually with this registry, we may be able to figure out what the interactions are between uh, the different subtypes. If you add several subtypes together, does that make you another subtype and uh, earmark you for a specific uh, treatment? So uh, hopefully we will eventually know more about that. Is it still CVS if you have severe nausea, but don't vomit, but you have all, all the other symptoms coincide? This is a tough question, and I, I pulled this one out um, uh, knowing that it, there's not an easy answer. So if um, I look at our teenagers, and especially teenage girls, uh, what have I seen? I, I've seen CVS go on, and then some start to have this morning sickness in between. And we actually have described that in the Journal of Pediatrics. Uh, uh, Dr. Kovacek was the first author on that. Uh, I believe I was the last author. <clears throat> and, uh, and so it seemed to morph into uh, morning sickness like they were pregnant. And uh, interestingly, by noon or 1 p.m., they did better. And then um, they could eat and uh, go to afternoon school, evening school, and then next morning they couldn't get out of bed once again. Uh, obviously that can be POTS, uh, it can be other things as well, um, but um, most often it was uh, not very, uh, uh, only, only we have really described this. Now, uh, as I've talked to Dr. Kovacek, uh, who's continuing to follow these patients, Many of them then give up the vomiting, and then they just go on to have this daily nausea. And that's very troublesome. Um, and uh, what 
they would now they would be reclassified. They wouldn't be classified as CVS or coalescent CVS. They would be um, classified as functional nausea, which is a new category uh, in the Rome 4 criteria for children. And that came about as a result of our papers that they, they made a, a new diagnostic category. But there is something on the spectrum, if you follow me, that uh, some start with CVS, then go to CVS plus daily nausea, mostly teenage girls, and then some give up the CVS and just go on the nausea. And uh, I will tell, I know there's a question on that, uh, and I will just anticipate it, that there is no anti-nausea drug. Nothing is effective. All of the medications are fairly good or great, on vomiting, but there is no such thing as an effective anti-nausea medication, uh, unfortunately. What I will say is that um, uh, the uh, publication uh, by uh, Dr. Kovacek on the ear stimulator is one of the breakthroughs, promising breakthroughs, so some people are using this. Uh, some people have used implantable electrodes um, called, uh, you know, uh, gastric electrical pacing, uh, but that's a surgical thing. Uh, but uh, the ear stimulator, uh, I think, is an alternative, but you have to find somebody who will do it and it has to be replaced every week. And uh, they run, for example, just the cost of that is about 500 and some insurance companies uh, obviously won't cover that. Uh, but there, some of the kids improve pretty dramatically on that. But there are no uh, good medication, I will tell you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, what supplements can an adult take to help manage? And going along with that, how do we understand the dosages? So um, I did put it in the slide. And uh, if you want some rough numbers, the, the numbers for CoQ10 would be about uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram. So you have to convert. Uh, so for an adult, that would be something like 600, which would might be 300 twice a day. A standard that they used in the trials was 400 a day. Uh, but I would say 600, it seems to be very, very safe. Um, some brands seem to be better than others. Um, and um, with the riboflavin, Again, it is in the same range, about 10 per kilo. Riboflavin is vitamin B2. Uh, you can get it more easily as opposed to separate vitamin B2 in vitamin B100, which everything is at 100 milligrams, all the B complex. There's no toxicity because you just pee out the extra and that makes your urine yellow. Uh, and um, uh, th those have both been studied for the treatment of migraines. Uh, and used as monotherapy in randomized controlled trials and did significantly attenuate the frequency of migraines in patients. Uh, so those are the two easiest ones. Uh, uh, now, if you say, I've been taking it for six months, I don't think it's doing anything, you could ask your physician to get a blood level, and the target we use is a cardiac target of about two to three times the upper limits of normal. So we're actually trying to achieve a supranormal uh, level. And, uh, and then if that doesn't work, then you're, you probably are not responding uh, to it. Um, now, I will have to say something about L-carnitine. That's the other thing that we use commonly in kids. It's used in metabolic diseases and so forth. Carnitine, unfortunately, is, a, is broken down by uh, bacteria and they form a substance called trimethylamine oxide. And this substance is extremely atherosclerotic in animals, and now there's some uh, some literature suggesting that it does the same thing in adults. So now we are, are very concerned about this. Uh, and so uh, from uh, my regular standpoint, I'm uh, less inclined to prescribe it. So it's not that carnitine is a normal substance in your body. You make your own carnitine. Red meat has carnitine. Avocado has carnitine. Uh, and white meat does not. Um, so it is a normal substance that helps particularly 
fuel the energy in your heart, uh, for your heart to pump. Um, but it, uh, in this byproduct, has a very negative uh, effect on your uh, arteries. And so we have to exert caution with that too. Uh, the other one that I might mention, and um, we are struggling as how to deal with it. Obviously, I don't deal with adults, but amitriptyline in a huge uh, survey in England, almost 500,000 people, uh, and drugs like that. Other drugs, not only amitriptyline, but uh, quite a few other drugs, uh, were associated with dementia if they were used in longer than three years. Uh, and it seems to be the anticholinergic effect of that. And so once again, these are things that we are beginning to weigh because we don't know really the long term. Uh, and for some, it is the only thing that works. And so obviously quality of life, uh, you know, has to be taken into consideration. So difficult issues. Definitely. Um, what do I do when the hospital refuses to treat me? This is a difficult issue, again, because uh, as you can imagine, uh, if you or your child has been in multiple times, obviously there may be a bias. And, uh, and obviously one of the biases is that, oh, they're a drug seeker, they want uh, narcotics, or they're a cannabis abuser, you know, and this is very unfortunate. I think the what I recommend, and I, I've talked to ER staffs uh, and uh, thought about the best way to deal with them. The, obviously the best is to deal with them when you're well and make an appointment. And uh, the two people I recommend, the most effective I think would be the head nurse of the e ED uh, at a time when she's just doing administrative work and come in, come in prepared with your protocol, come in and prepared with, uh, with articles from CVSA or, you know, the uh, adult guidelines or pediatric guidelines and, uh, and, and really start a negotiation and eventually really a partnership so that they understand it's a legitimate uh, disorder, it's been diagnosed properly, and there are treatments and that uh, you should... And, Every ER cannot turn away a patient, you know, so uh, they're mandated federally to be able to do that. But uh, to get them as part of the partnership is to meet with them when you're feeling uh, decent and it's easy to talk because obviously when you're completely nauseated, you're out of it and uh, whatever assumptions they're making, you know, they can't really communicate effectively with you uh, and, uh, and they may be completely on the wrong tangent. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, I think that is, in my mind, the best thing. Obviously, having a physician advocate for you is very important. Um, and uh, an efficient physician that may not be on the ER staff, because usually that's just ER physicians, but is a, uh, on staff at that hospital and, and then has some sway with the emergency department. Absolutely. And I will mention that most of the articles that you would want to take, we do have on our website. We're happy to send them to you as well if um, you're ever in need of those articles. Um, have cases of CVS increased since about 1955 to present? Or this is it just better recognized? <laughs> this is also <laughs> a very difficult question. And I, I picked up some of these that I, I, I don't even have the answer to, but were worth discussing. We don't know uh, because um, uh, really there was so little awareness until CVSA came along, CVS UK, CVS US uh, under Kathleen. Um, we don't know. Uh, I think pediatric gastroenterologists are getting better and uh, doing a pretty good job. Uh, I would say adult gastroenterologists still uh, plus minus, you know, the guidelines are out, but there are many, many guidelines. I can tell you there are probably five or 10 guidelines, new guidelines a week coming out for internal medicine. So obviously people don't read many of them, particularly in a disorder they're not interested in. They'll read about hypertension. Um, so 
it's, it's very difficult to say. There is growing awareness. And for example, uh, when I was going to the adult GI meetings, uh, there are about 15,000 gastroenterologists attending those. Uh, now, of course, uh, they, they, they're, they've gone uh, virtual. Um, at the beginning, we didn't know they were adults, but I would be at my poster and then uh, adult gastroenterologists would come up and say, you know, I think I've seen some of these. And, uh, and so we began to hear enough stories that that's why I organized the first meeting in 2006 with Kathleen's help at the NCW, the first meeting on adults with CVS and out of that came a manuscript. Um, but prior to that, it didn't exist, but there clearly had to be cases. I even saw adults who kind of found their way to me, young adults uh, with CVS who you know, couldn't find any other resources uh, 25 years ago. Uh, and uh, I would see them in the clinic. They had been labeled as gastroparesis and, and other things or functional, like it's in your mind or, or something like that. Obviously people didn't take them seriously. So now we're on a better uh, platform. Now that we have formal guidelines, uh, it is a legitimate disorder. We still don't understand it well enough, uh, but you should be able to get help uh, with this. Uh, there really isn't any excuse for that. Um, and so to answer the question, I, I don't know whether it's going up. I will say that there are some people that feel that functional disorders are going up in general because of stress of uh, civilization, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, that, uh, that these are being more common. Thank you. Is Barometric pressure, like from, like from flying in an airplane, still considered a possible trigger. This was a, also a very interesting one. And this is something, uh, and I will tell you, a lot of what I've learned is from you people. Uh, and uh, this is one I learned um, gradually over the years. And uh, the index case, like the first case I showed you, I mean, I learned so much from this family. Uh, and about the, this child who's now an adult and living uh, fine, uh, doing well. Um, I heard this story, but I wasn't sure what to make of it, uh, that, um, that weather changes would be a trigger. Uh, they can be for migraine. And then I had a, a, a father and son uh, that came to see me and the father said, it's interesting. I watch the uh, weather report, I see the front come in, and I get a severe migraine, and my son has an episode of CVS, but you know he's not watching the weather uh, with me, and I'm not telling him anything about it. And they would fire off in tandem. Uh, and so after that, I began thinking about this. Uh, chronic sinusitis is a trigger. Could sinus pressure be a trigger? Uh, and then I did get individual uh, reports where air travel would be. So while on the plane, um, uh, disembarking from the plane, kind of, you know, as you descend, your ears, uh, uh, you know, get stuffed and then pop, uh, would trigger off episodes. So we, we would definitely uh, try to treat them uh, with Zofran. Uh, now maybe I would use um, uh, a prepotent, uh, obviously very expensive, uh, and, and try to do that as well, um, to, to do that. So yes, I do believe that barometric pressure, whether because of uh, sinus receptors uh, or inner ear, um, not sure where it actually is, but it does seem to be a trigger. And sp speaking of triggers, can years of sexual assault and abuse contribute and act as a trigger? This is, uh, I'm sorry to hear about this. I, I do think it can, and I will give you um, uh, two ex examples, one general and one uh, specific. Uh, the general one is that if you look at uh, adults with functional GI disorders, that includes irritable bowel syndrome, uh, uh, things like that, uh, when you look at the early histories, it's been shown that uh, significantly more have suffered either child neglect, uh, ch uh, child abuse, sexual abuse. 
And uh, so essentially, it's almost like leaving a post-traumatic stress situation. And, uh, and so if you look at these individuals, you can show uh, that survivors of this kind of abuse, their endocrine response is like a person with post-traumatic stress. So there, it's very blunted uh, 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 stress response. Now, uh, the individual case that taught me that I was sitting and when I helped uh, Dr. Venkatesan get started, um, I kind of recruited her in the effort and I sat with her in clinic for about six months. And uh, one woman said, you know, I get this every November and I can't say why, I don't think it's allergies, a change of season, uh, you know, she had kind of gone through a whole list. And then, I happened to ask her, even though I was a pediatrician in the in the in the, the exam room, I said, "Has anything catastrophic happened uh, in November? Because you you get this every November." And she thought, and tears started rolling down her face, and she said, "You know, that's my birthday, and uh, my husband, we're divorced now, would always abuse me around my birthday." And uh, it was a very, very sad situation, but I thought that that maybe, in fact, that was uh, playing a role. So I do think that it, it certainly could be playing a role. Um, yes. I have a few people ask me that about in the office as well, so that's an interesting answer. Um, can hearing loss be a cause of CVS? Um, there was something I was going to take on to that, but I guess we'll just go there. Can hearing loss be a cause of CDS? I don't think so. And I think part of the disclaimer is that we don't know what the cause of CDS is. Uh, we think that there is some sort of susceptibility but then something may be uh, triggered off. I, uh, you know, we just talked about abuse, uh, but I have certainly, uh, it, it's usually a course in a family that has migraines, but then the parents will say, this started after a car accident, it started after uh, my son broke up with his girlfriend, I mean, you know, right after that. Uh, but I don't think that's the cause. In other words, I think that's a trigger that kind of un mask a tendency towards this and uh, I think a bunch of things could do it whether it, it's a severe infection um, maybe Lyme disease or something uh, or some traumatic uh, personal event I think all of those are are very possible uh, hearing loss I have not heard of that but of course I'm dealing mostly with children so that's not one that rings a bell I, I, pardon the pun. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> that was a good pun. Can you talk about the treatments for dizziness? I uh, pulled this question out, and it's also a frustrating one because there isn't any good treatment, just like nausea. Uh, as you know, histamine one, things like dramamine, Benadryl, um, hydroxazine, or Atarax, there, there are lots of uh, those out there. Uh, that are, are sold uh, for the treatment of dizziness. And, um, you know, by and large, they don't work that well. Um, and I will say that there are some exercises that uh, ear, nose, and throat specialists use. They're called vestibular rehabilitation exercises. Some are called by names, but you, you basically have to roll your head around and roll the semicircular fluid in the middle ear. Um, I definitely have prescribed them, uh, haven't, um, uh, haven't really seen that work. Um, I will say that it, some of the kids after their episodes have really intractable dizziness. And so that's what kind of keeps them. They stop the vomiting, the nausea is better, but they're just really dizzy. There is a migraine uh, condition called benign proxismal vertigo, uh, which can just be by itself. Uh, in other words, you just get these spells where you, you know, everything is, is going in circles. 
uh, and uh, and migraine uh, and neurologists generally handle that, but it's uh, that can be a, a weird manifestation of migraine um, as well. Okay, um, can you speak a little bit about the um, the anxiety piece and the best way to treat it? Um, this particular person is asking about their child has CBS and POTS, um, but the anxiety is really a big issue. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, as you saw from the talk that I think this is a, a big issue and sometimes the key issue, and I will tell you that Sally Tarbell, who I work with for many years, uh, sometimes, it was apparent to me that what she did was more important than anything I did uh, with medication. Um, and But it does have to be the right person. Not everybody has skill. I will tell you that with pediatric psychologists that deal with medical patients as opposed to just psychological patients, uh, but medical patients who have psychological issues such as anxiety, which is very, very common in functional disorders like irritable bowel syndrome. Um, they, uh, there are not that many psychologists that are interested in this. They, they like the behavioral approach, but it takes more time to do cognitive behavioral therapy. I would say one is obviously if you're close to Chicago, Dr. Tarbell is at Lurie Children's Hospital. Uh, but that, uh, you know, uh, that may not be possible. I think the other thing is there are some apps out there that you can use. Um, and you, you may have to search them, but there are little apps that, that teach you to do deep breathing, uh, kind of meditative breathing, um, and then kind of remind you to do it, um, that send little reminders. So people are using it. There are some CDs out there. Uh, that uh, some of the expert psychologists, um, I'm trying to think, uh, you, uh, I don't, I haven't looked recently to see if it's wrong, but uh, Miranda Van Tilburg, uh, T-I-L-B-U-R-G, at uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, is, uh, I think was working on a CD to, uh, to deal with this. Um, hypnosis, uh, one of my fellows wanted to do hypnosis. Uh, that has a good evidence base in abdominal pain, in, and it seemed to last six weeks of hypnosis, lasted more than one year, and now they've done five-year follow-ups on recurrent abdominal pain, which is another functional disorder, and it has this incredible lasting compared to standard medical therapy. Uh, so we don't know in CBS, but it is uh, potentially possible. And uh, I, I would say one other approach, and it's pretty draconian, but uh, I have had success with this as well. If uh, the child teenager is un completely unable to go to school and uh, gets into a point where we're even concerned about so-called school phobia, that you know, it gets harder and harder to go back, we have sent them to comprehensive rehabilitation programs. The Mayo Clinic has one, Cincinnati has one, University of Cincinnati Children's, uh, Case Western has one. Uh, some are, are inpatient, many of them are outpatient, but you have to be on site with a parent uh, uh, at the same time because a parent actually goes through a process too, and they redo lifestyle, uh, work habits, and actually the child sets up their own kind of uh, system so that if they get less dysfunctional, they don't get rewarded for that. They get rewarded for being more functional. Uh, and uh, they, they, set up the, um, they set up the whole reward system themselves. And I've seen some major success with these. So they're dealing with uh, with stress, anxiety on an individual, family, and group basis with a whole group that's uh, at the same time, uh, as well as lifestyle issues, uh, sometimes weaning them off medications uh, and take a comprehensive approach. So 
uh, they're not focused on CVS per se, but some of them are focused on uh, arthritis and so forth, but they, they do take uh, other kinds of kids with other medical issues as well, such as CVS. Thank you for that answer. I do know a family that did do that, that has CVS and were, was very happy that they did it. Um, why does a hot shower on the chest help, but then only very temporarily? This is a conundrum. <laughs> I uh, have been looking for the answer for many years since I heard the story in kids. Uh, and uh, the, the most uh, telling was, um, you know, uh, they uh, will exhaust all the water, all, all of water in, in the household, right? So the, the 40 gallon tank is empty and then the nausea and the bombing come right back. So the I know some families, they deal with this, interestingly, by checking into a hotel. And then, you know, with unlimited hot water and it can go on. But what is the mechanism? I've asked a lot of autonomic specialists. It has to be doing something for the autonomic system, like calming it down in a way. And one of the ways that we do that medically is sometimes we use um, things like clonidine, um, uh, the, the, this, uh, the uh, general anesthetic I talked about is also an autonomic stabilizer. And so whether that somehow stabilizes the autonomic system, it calms it down because it's in this maximal mode where it's just hard charging fight or flight. Uh, I'm not sure whether that is. And so I've asked a lot of people who are in the business of the autonomic uh, nervous system of studying that and understanding of doing testing and nobody has given me a response but i it's clear that it is doing something major uh, and attenuating uh, something and calming the autonomic nervous system interesting given that there are various features shared between migraine and epilepsy and epilepsy has benefited from a ketogenic diet is there a possibility that therapeutic keto or a ketogenic diet can be applied to CVS? Uh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a stumper. Um, <laughs> that's why I asked it. <laughs> I don't think, um, I'm trying to think. I do have patients with, uh, with epilepsy and CVS. And one of the things that I learned from them is that a couple of them actually had the implanted vagal nerve stimulator. And when they cranked it up, because you can crank the intensity up, the CVS went away. And so that gave me, and you know, I talked to Katya, uh, Dr. Kovacek, and uh, so you know, we began to think, could this work? Obviously, we don't, we're not gonna do surgical but that's how she then uh, eventually went out and found this ear vagal stimulator. Um, so the question, we do know anticonvulsants work. Uh, so topiramate, uh, at least four, five, five of them. Uh, let me mention them. Uh, phenobarb was the first one reported, but it has a lot of learning disability, uh, but it's reversible, cognitive dysfunction. Uh, Top pyramate, uh, also unfortunately all the anticonvulsants do. Uh, zonisamide, zonagrin, uh, levetiracetam, which is Keppra. Um, uh, Top pyramate is Topamax and Depakote or uh, uh, Depakine, um, and that has been used more widely in um, in in Japan for CVS. Uh, so a ketogenic diet, I think. You know, if you follow that rationale that it somehow causes the excitable neurons uh, uh, would be possible. Obviously, it's a very difficult, strict diet, um, but I think it is possible. It is possible. But uh, there's no evidence I haven't heard uh, in my almost 1,300. I don't think I have um, anybody that... Uh, that did that and told me that uh, their CBS got better, so. Great. Um, what about deep fried and spicy foods? Have you heard of those as being triggers? Hi, making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, some have told me that dyes 
like a yellow dye is a, a very specific trigger. And uh, if they got rid of that, then the episodes uh, got better, MSG. Uh, and so um, I have heard, for example, that there are uh, some families, you know, we talked about HEs that said certain brands of frozen pizza will do it and certain will not. So it is dependent on the cheese. Um, so I don't know if it's spicy per se, but uh, obviously food is complex, the so spices are complex, additives, but particularly for processed food are complex. So uh, it, it is possible, but spicy foods per se, um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, obviously for reflux, uh, that can certainly make it worse. All right, and I think this will be our final question as we're getting close to two hours here. Um, would you know anything about dys dysmenorrhea in adults related to CVS? Um, this person is specifically asking about that she only gets her period during a severe episode. I kind of think it's the other way around, uh, that the, the, the period and the hormonal changes at the period are triggering. So this is what we would call catamenial CVS, or uh, you know, if you were a neurologist, you would call it menstrual migraine, uh, really the same thing. And so the theory behind that is that uh, it's the drop in estrogen, which is very steep. It's like a falling off a cliff, and that triggers the, the uh, migraine headache, or in our case, CVS. So the way that we have treated, and I, I would say, unfortunately, I haven't published it, but have had a fair amount of success, is using um, low-dose estrogen, you know, something like low estrogen, uh, and there are others now, uh, newer ones, uh, which uh, are low and then it's not uh, a steep drop and that seems to help and sometimes you can do that uh, literally for 90 days so that you don't allow a period for 90 days and then of course they will go into an episode. The other way to do it that gives you three months is been um, uh, using Depo-Provera but you can get weight gain with that uh, but uh, it, it will stop the period for about three months. Now, if you would choose to do something and you do know that you are getting a period uh, on a planned basis, then there are some things that you could do. One protocol uh, is that they gave long-acting triptans called Frova triptan. This has been published five days in a row, starting right before the period. Uh, and then they seem to get fewer menstrual migraines. Uh, what we um, obviously, in children, most of the time, I should say in adolescent girls, most of the time we're using the birth control pills and that's successful. But let's say you've got to let them have the period periodically, what would you do? Uh, then I would consider using this Frova triptan protocol or using something like uh, the uh, a prepotent or emend and trying to dose them starting like the day before the, the anticipated period when you're uh, stopping, you know, you're doing the placebo uh, birth control pills, uh, the sugar pills, and so forth. So uh, come up with a plan to, to do that. So I think that um, I, I don't have a definitive answer. Obviously, I'm, I'm not a, a gynecologist and, and uh, you know, studied that uh, <laughs> five decades ago. But I would say that, um, yeah, to me that makes sense. And, uh, and perhaps with uh, a gynecologist or some sort of regulation, perhaps uh, you could achieve better control um, uh, of that. Um, the alternative would just be to take something all the time. If you don't know when the periods are coming with dysmenorrhea, the one would be amitriptyline. Uh, the other uh, I could suggest it would be the aprepitent, the 125 milligrams twice a week as a preventative uh, approach. So um, I think uh, the observation that it occurs just with the periods uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Perfect. Thank you. One last very quick question. Okay. Some people are asking what the name of the program is at Mayo Clinic that you were speaking about. Uh, it's called the um, Pediatric Pain Management uh, Program. 
uh, pediatric pain management program. And um, they do take uh, children that have disabling POTS to CVS to uh, abdominal pain and, uh, and so on that need more than just a psychologist. They need to have kind of get back on track. You know, in other words, they've been out of school. They can't do exercise. Uh, they're essentially disabled, if you will. And so the, the essential model that they're, they're approaching, uh, if you want to know the uh, essential principles, is um, uh, that uh, it's a rehabilitation model. And, and so the analogy I can give you, if you go to the sports medicine a doctor or you're, you're a professional athlete telling LeBron James, they don't say, I want you to be pain-free, then you can go play uh, pro basketball. They say, okay, how do we get to the point where you can play pro basketball with some discomfort? And so the rehabilitation model is getting a child moving and functional in school, extracurricular activities, even though they still have episodes of vomiting or they still have POTS. So it's really rehabilitation to function. So the, the, the outcome is not pain-free or episode-free. The outcome is to make you functional, get you back to the, the, the world of the living. So that's the uh, key. Uh, and so, uh, vomiting episodes no longer becomes a criteria. How you function it becomes a criteria. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Lee so much for spending your, well, in Wisconsin, it's our afternoon um, <laughs> with us. Um, I do want to tell everyone, thank you for being patient. We were having some issues at the beginning, as you could see, with technology is not always our friend. Um, and also thank you to Kathleen for uh, popping on for a few minutes to talk about um, all the guideline initiatives and the importance of the pediatric guidelines. And look for us next month. We're hoping to make this uh, a monthly uh, presentation for with different experts um, surrounding CDS. So I appreciate everybody's time. Okay, thank you all for coming on and uh, enjoyed uh, uh, ta talking to you at least one way. Um, so <laughs> good, good luck to everybody. I know it's a very difficult battle, um, but uh, hopefully uh, given you some, some avenues that, that will be helpful. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yes, absolutely. Debbie, Debbie could I just make one more comment? Real of quick. course, Kathleen. Yeah. Um, I, this has been a goal for CVSA for at least 15 years to have physician input and the amount of work and energy that Blinda and Debbie have put into this opportunity is remarkable. So much is going on behind the scenes that we don't know. And I think that the product again is so well worth the effort, I hope. So thank you so much to Blinda and Debbie for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Debbie and Blinda. Yes, I apologize, Belinda, I didn't thank you. Belinda has been on and being helpful um, as well. So thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day, everyone.